it it should be fairly self-explanatory and shouldn't have too many screw-ups in it. <coughs> okay, um, pick up with the chapter of the Silver Dough. We left off last week, and I'm going to try and talk a little bit faster this week to try to get through all of these little pages that I have marked. Um, yeah, if you've got your papers, just bring them up here. There's a stapler up here. <clears throat> if you remember, when we left off last week, um, we talked about how here he hit rock bottom. After his wand was destroyed, he, they'd gone to um, Godric's Hollow to try to talk to Matilda Bagshot and find out more of his family history, per se. And in fact, that chapter ended, um, The Life and Lies of Albus Dumbledore, almost ended with Harry feeling that they were as insignificant as insects beneath that wide sky. I mean, that, that's about as bleak as you can get, okay? And then we get the silver dough. It's still snowing. It's still Christmas Day, or, or a day might have passed. It's not quite clear. Um... And they disapparate somewhere else. They leave where they were, just outside of Godric's Hollow, and they go to another location. This time, Hermione takes them to the Forest of Dean. The Forest of Dean is in the west country of England. It's in Gloucestershire, and it's a place that uh, J.K. Rowling used to visit as a child. I mean, she and her family would go on holiday there. Okay? It actually is not that far away from one of the houses that she lived in. So when she brings in Forest of Dean, she's bringing in familiar stomping ground for herself. And in doing so, she's kind of personalizing um, the story. Snow's all over. Hermione says, you know, I came camping here with my mom and dad, blah, 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 blah. So a couple days go by, and we're told on... Page 364 or so, to give you an idea of the difference between the pagination between the British edition and the American edition, um, the British edition, this is on page 297, okay? Words are closer together, lines are closer together. I mean, they're, they're just packing it into fewer pages. This book only has 600 and seven pages in the British edition. And if I remember right, it's over 700 in the American um, edition. I guess it's because Americans have to sound out the words or something. Anyways, two nights go by, two days and nights go by, and Harry's not sleeping well. He's still dealing with the loss of his wand. Okay, But we're told that his, his senses are more alert than usual. Okay. He goes and he sits in the open mouth of the tent, just looking out. He's got on all the sweaters he can wear. Okay. And he just kind of looks off into the forest. And he suddenly sees a bright silver light out in the forest. This is going to be now... Uh, around 365 somewhere, okay? Maybe still 364. He sees the light, and he sees it moving through the trees. It steps out from behind an oak, and it's a silver-white doe, okay? Dazzling. She walks over the ground. Harry watches her, filled with wonder, not at her strangeness, but at her inexplicable familiarity. Inexplicable. Can't be explained. He doesn't know why, but he knows this deer. Okay? He felt that he'd been waiting for her to come, but that he'd forgotten until this moment when they had arranged to meet. He gets up and he follows it. Okay? They're hiding from Voldemort and all of Voldemort's followers. Here he sees a white glowing deer off in the forest and decides it's a good idea to go off and follow this thing. Okay. As he follows her, she disappears into the forest. Harry ignites his wand. Okay. He holds it up, can't see her anywhere. 
But she has led him somewhere. This is probably 365 or 66. Something gleamed in the light of the wand, and Harry spun about, but all that there was was a small frozen pool, its cracked black surface glittering as he raised the wand higher to examine it. Okay, so he walks off into the forest. There's a little pool of water. The ice in it is cracked. Has anybody else been in this area of the Forest of Dean in the last two or three days? Other than the doe, as far as Harry knows. No. Why would the ice be cracked? If nothing else has been here, okay, and it's been freezing cold, this pond of water ought to be solid. And it's been cracked recently. So, Harry stoops down, points his wand at it. Raises the wand higher, excuse me. He moved forward rather cautiously and looked down. The ice reflected his distorted shadow and the beam of wand light, so he's holding the wand like up here, so he's casting his shadow over it. But deep below the thick, misty gray carapace, something else glinted. A great silver cross. Now, there's a tradition in the Orthodox Church, and I don't know if J.K. Rowling knows it, but it sure seems to me like she does. But there's a tradition tradition in the Orthodox Church. I don't want to use that yellow marker again because that took a long time to get off. Um, <laughs> that on January 6th, which is what's called the Feast of Epiphany, um, the Russian Orthodox or the Orthodox Churches all around the world have a have a huge um, celebration. It's a major feast day. And they do this blessing of the waters. Okay, The blessing of the waters means or signifies it's the blessing of all creation. Everything gets transformed. Okay, But one of the things that's done in that, and it's, it's really done with a lot of verve and gusto by the Greek Orthodox and the Russian Orthodox. Okay, Greek Orthodox is a lot more understandable because, I mean, if you're in the Isles of Greece and you're simply jumping into the Aegean or the Mediterranean and it's January 6th, the water's not that cold. I mean, the Aegean and the Mediterranean in January, they're like the Gulf of Mexico. How cold does the Gulf of Mexico get during the winter? 60, 65, maybe? Where I'm from, California, the pretty much the standard temperature of the water off Santa Cruz is 52 degrees. You're in there for longer than five minutes without a wetsuit on, you're dead because of hypothermia. Okay? So... What they do is the priest will take a cross and they'll throw it out in the water of a lake, a pond, a river, an ocean, etc. And usually young men of the church will strip down to either their underwear or swim trunks and dive in after it. If they're doing this in Russia, okay, January 6th, if they're old calendar Russians, they do it January, two weeks later, than that, January 20th. Okay? That means they have to cut the ice out so they can throw the cross into the water. And then the guys jump into, through ice that's anywhere from a foot to two feet thick into the water. So the water's 32 degrees. Okay? Freezing, freezing cold. Look at the scene again. We have a frozen pond. It's cracked. And here he sees beneath the ice a silver cross. And then we're going to be told a glint of deep red. It was a sword with glittering rubies in its hilt. Okay? If these Orthodox priests are throwing in a metal cross, you can almost guarantee that the metal cross will have gems on it, rubies on it. Why rubies? Why not lapis lazuli? Lapis lazuli is a, a blue. Rubies are deep red. Okay, They signify the blood of Christ. Again, this isn't a cross, however. What is it? It's the sword of Godric Gryffindor. So what is Harry seeing? He's seeing this part 
of the cross, which has, we're told, rubies the size of hen's eggs embedded in the hilt. Okay? He's not seeing this part until he gets closer to it. Why? Because it's deeper down into the water. And again, this is a few days after Christmas. I, I just can't help but think she's playing on that um, Orthodox tradition. Anyways, it's a sword with glittering rubies in its hilt. The sword of God Griff Gryffindor was lying at the bottom of the fourth pool. How is this possible? Harry asks or thinks. Okay. He points the wand at the silvery shape. Notice, Harry for once is thinking. He is teachable. Oxio sword. But it doesn't come. And he sells, says, help. But help doesn't come. Why not? Help, he murmured. But the sword remained upon the pool, bottom indifferent, motionless. What was it Dumbledore had told him the last time? Only a true Gryffindor could have pulled that out of the hat. Okay. He's walking around the pond. He's looking off in the forest like he's hoping somebody's going to come. He does defendo. He cracks the ice. So now there's a means of going down and getting the sword. But what does that entail? It's, you know, December 27th or 28th. It's freezing outside. He had to crack the ice to get to the liquid water beneath it. But the sword is still in the water at the bottom of the pond. As far as Harry could judge, it was not deep, but to retrieve the sword, he would have to submerge himself completely. You know, it's not like he's going to lower himself down in the pond and try and use his toe to grab it by the hilt and pull it up to his hand. Contemplating the task ahead would not make it easier or the water warmer. Have you ever been in that kind of situation where you've got to do something and you know it's not going to be pleasant and you start to think about it? What does that tend to do? It makes it even more unpleasant. Okay? He steps on the pool's edge, places Hermione's wand on the ground, still lit. Every pore of his body screamed in protest. The very air in his lungs seemed to freeze as he was submerged to his shoulders. Notice he does ease himself in. Okay. He feels for it with his feet. He only wanted to dive once. He put the moment, he put off the moment of total submersion from second to second, gasping, shaking, till he told himself it must be done. And then he dives. Okay. He has the locket around his neck. The cold was agony. It attacked him like fire. Have you ever been so cold, had your fingers so cold, it felt like they were burning? It's usually what happens just before frostbite starts to set in. So don't let that happen. He thought of water weeds, though nothing had brushed him as he died. Raised his empty hand to free himself. It was not weed. The chain on the horcrux tightened around his neck. Why? Slytherin Gryffindor. Opposites here are not attracting. Okay. He kicks out widely, wildly, tries to push himself back to the surface and can't. Okay. Choking, retching, soaking, colder than he'd ever been in his life, he came face, came to face, he came to face down in the snow. Harry, I'm skipping a little bit. Harry had no strength to lift his head and see his savior's identity. All he, notice that his saviors. All he could do was raise a shaking hand to his throat, feel the place where the locket had cut tightly into his flesh. It was gone. Are you mental? And it's Ron. Out of thin air, seemingly, Ron shows up. Why the hell, Ron says, didn't you take this thing off before you dived? Harry wasn't thinking. Okay. And then Harry says, you cast that dough? Nope. I thought it was you. My Patronus is a stag. Yeah. I thought it looked different. No antlers. <laughs> Ron would probably fail at animal husbandry. Um, so, Ron says, I've come back if you still want me. Okay. So, they talk about the sword, and 
skip a bunch. They use the sword to break open the locket. But what does the locket attempt to do? And I know in the film they went all crazy with this. I mean, really, yes, and I, I saw snippets of that, I guess trailers. You know, they have the locket show Hermione, you know, tempting Ron and all this kind of nonsense go on. Anyways, they get the locket destroyed, okay, and uh, they go on to see Xenophilius Lovegood in the next chapter. Uh, in fact, just skip that chapter and go on to the tale of the three brothers. So they, they're at Xenophilius Lovegoods, and they're talking about the Deathly Hallows Mark. <clears throat> and Xenophilius tells them, the first page of the chapter, that it's a symbol to reveal oneself to other believers. So is it like any other symbol in the real world? Okay. Like this, or this, or if you're a Darwinian atheist, you know, this with, what is it? Something eating the fish coming up behind it? Or the fish with legs on it? Okay. Notice, he says, it's a secret mark. It's a mark for people who are in a kind of a community of believers. Okay? And here's, the, I'm sorry, I, I still don't get it. Well, you see, believers seek the deathly hallows. Okay? And so he tells them about the tale of the three brothers, which is kind of a ripoff of uh, Geoffrey Chaucer's The Partner's Tale. It's based on The Partner's Tale. Okay? And he goes over the story of the three brothers, and then he says, um, when he finishes it, next page, probably, that is a children's tale told to amuse rather than to instruct. Those of us who understand these matters, however, recognize that the ancient story refers to three objects, or hallows, which, if united, will make the possessor master of death. And Hermione goes, um... But how can you possibly believe? That is, how can you believe in these things? Luna has told me all about you, young lady. You are, I gather, not unintelligent, but painfully limited, narrow, close-minded. Why is Hermione narrow and close-minded? She's logical. She's logical, okay? What else? Only, that. Only the facts. Only if something can be seen or proven or tested or verified. I think I've mentioned this before. Hermione would be a logical positivist. Okay? She and Ayn Rand would, uh, Ayn Rand would get along wonderfully okay? in, in that sense. So, Hermione says, well, we know there's such things as invisibility cloaks, but they're rare. They exist. And he says, no. The third hallow is a true cloak of invisibility. That is, it's not a traveling cloak imbued with a disillusionment charm. We're talking about a cloak that really and truly renders the wearer completely invisible and endures eternally. That is, this cloak can't be destroyed, giving constant and impenetrable concealment no matter what spells are cast at it. And yet, what do we learn about Harry's cloak with one teacher? Mad-Eye Moody can see Harry when he's under the cloak. But Mad-Eye Moody's eye isn't casting a spell at it. Okay, so there's something else going on there, apparently. So, he asks Hermione, how many cloaks have you ever seen like that, Miss Granger? And she doesn't say, but she has seen one. Okay. 
She says, okay, okay. Say the cloak existed. What about the stone? The thing you call the resurrection stone. Well, what of it? Well, how can that be real? Prove that it's not. <laughs> it's impossible to prove it doesn't exist. Do you expect me to get hold of, of all the pebbles in the world and test them? I mean, you could claim that anything's real if the only basis for believing in it is that nobody's proven or proved it doesn't exist. And notice what he says. Glad to see you're opening your mind a little bit. Why is J.K. Rowling including this? I think she wants her readers to kind of open their minds a little bit to what is real and what is not real. Now, crumple horn snort kecks or whatever the things are, probably not. But Hamlet says, there is more in heaven and earth than is dreamt of in your philosophy, Horatio. Horatio is a stoic. Part of what that means is he believes in only what can be seen, what can be tasted, what can be felt. He believes only in sensory perceptions. Okay? Harry, okay, so the elder one, you think that exists too? And he says, of course. There's evidence of that. Okay? So there's evidence of the Elder Wand, and there's, we've seen it from book one forward, there's evidence of the invisibility cloak. What evidence is there of the resurrection stone? Until we get to the end of the novel. Okay? So, they keep talking about it, and we find out that, you know, Harry and Hermione had seen this. The Deathly Hallows was on Ignotus Peveril's grave, and they're the three brothers behind the original story of the, in the Tales of the Beetle the Bard. They keep talking, and Hermione says, um, Harry and I were raised by muggles. We were taught different superstitions. Notice what Hermione is saying about Xenophilius Lovegood's belief system. It's what? It's superstition. Okay. It, it's, it's just a morality tale. It's obvious which gift, gift is best, which one you choose. Meaning, when she says it's just a morality tale, she means it's just a tale told to children to teach them morality. In other words, there's nothing true about it. Okay. And then she makes the comment, it's obvious which gift is best. And yet, it's so obvious that each of the three of them choose a different gift. So how obvious is it? Ron says the wand. Hermione says the cloak. Harry says the stone. Why? Why do they each choose those? Why does Ron with the wand? Not as much as Percy. But what would the wand do for Ron? What has Ron never done? Because he has six older brothers. He's never stood out. He has the elder wand. He's going to stand out. Why does Hermione want the cloak? Because she always stands out. Every class session, whose hand is up first? Not that, you know, she does have a choice about that. She doesn't have to be a little miss know-it-all. Okay. Why does Harry obviously want the stone? If the stone brings back the dead... Harry's got a lot of dead he'd like to bring back. Or at least he has a lot of dead he'd like to be able to talk to. Okay. So they keep talking. And they ask about where Luna is, and they find out Xenophilius has been trying to trap them. And we get chapter 22, The Deathly Hallows. 
That's where we find out Hermione's parents are in Australia. Okay. And the bottom of page 425, probably, Hermione says, I've never heard such nonsense in all my life. Ron. Okay, now, Ron doing this is showing that Ron's kind of, he's a go-between between between Harry and Hermione. Ron, yeah, but the death, the uh, Chamber of Secrets was supposed to be a myth, too. It's real. So what does that suggest? Maybe. Maybe it can be real. Maybe things that we don't think are real can be real. But the Deathly Hallows can't exist, Ron. Ron, you, you keep saying that. Harry's Invisibility Cloak, Hermione. The tale of the three brothers is a story. A story about humans are frightened of death. That's it. What does she mean? If surviving was as simple as hiding under the Invisibility Cloak, we'd have everything we need already. Harry, I don't know, we could do with an unbeatable wand. And then he goes on and he talks about when his wand connected with Voldemort. And he talks about the people who came out of Voldemort's wand. But they weren't really back from the dead, were they? Those kinds of pale imitations. They weren't pale imitations. Nearly Headless Nick is a pale imitation. Aren't the same as truly bringing someone back to life. Harry goes on and says, but she, the girl in the tale, she didn't really come back, did she? The story says once people are dead, they belong with the dead. But the second brother still got to see her and talk to her. He even lived with her for a while. So what does he seemingly do? Does he maybe cross over into her realm, wherever that is, whatever that is? Okay. So they keep talking. We're going to skip a bunch. Harry's thinking about the Elder One. This is... Um, About page 432. And the wand, the elder wand, where was that hidden? Where was Voldemort searching now? That paragraph. Hermione would not like that idea. Harry sneaking, I need to unite the Deathly Hallows. But then she did not believe. But all throughout the first part of the book, Harry wants to know. He didn't know what to believe. He didn't want to believe. Okay. So they go, they start to talk and think about Luna. And all Harry's thinking about now is the Deathly Hallows. Um, and he sees a vision-like thing. And the vision-like thing on 434 or so begins with a long paragraph that starts, even the mystery of the silver doe, which the other two insisted on discussing, seemed less important to Harry now. Right about in the middle of that paragraph. Harry was just able to make out the indistinct features of an object that looked like a skull and something like a mountain that was more shadow than substance. Used to images sharp as reality, Harry was disconcerted by the change. In other words, it, it's not like he has a direct line to Voldemort's mind anymore. Okay? A week go by, and they listen to, they overhear, Potter watch and such, and they hear Kingsley Shacklebolt's voice on page 440, and Kingsley says, Muggles remain ignorant of the source of their suffering as they continue to sustain heavy casualties. What's the source of their suffering? Voldemort and his followers. But where is it? The muggle world? The magical world. It's the magical world bleeding over into the muggle world. And he goes on and says, Every human life is worth the same and worth saving. Skipping a few paragraphs, they hear Lupin. The boy who lived remains a symbol of everything for which we are fighting. The triumph of good, the power of innocence, the need 
to keep resisting. The need to keep resisting even in the face of what? Defeat? To keep fighting? Malfoy Manor. Harry, Ron, Hermione get captured. Hermione does the whatever the spell is on Harry's face to make him all swollen and everything. Okay. We find out what time of year it is. This is, um, do my math, page five, no, 454. Or thereabouts. Harry and the others are brought in, and Narcissa says, follow me. My son Draco is home for his Easter holidays. If that's Harry Potter, he will know. So they bring Harry to Draco, and Draco says, I don't know. Why? Does Draco really not know? Draco's expression was full of reluctance, even fear, we're told. I don't know, he says, and he walks away. Notice, his father really wants it to be Harry, because he thinks he'll get back in good with Voldemort. Um, but Draco doesn't reveal Harry. Right? So they're going to do some torture on Hermione. Ron says, take me. They get sent down to the uh, cellar. Harry meets Wormtail down there when he comes down to get another one. And about 464, I think it is, um, Harry says, you're going to kill me after I saved your life? You owe me, Wormtail. And the silver fingers on Wormtail's hand slacken on Harry. And he sees, Harry just kind of watches in slow motion, the hand, you know, does this. And he tries to stop. He tries to save Wormtail from being killed. Why does the hand kill him? Why does Wormtail's silver hand kill him? Because it was given to him by Voldemort? Yeah, I think so. Because he betrayed Voldemort. Okay. And so Dobby arrives and escapes and saves them all except for the very last page. Dobby gets Harry last. And Harry looks around and he sees Dobby standing feet from him. The elf swayed slightly, stars reflected in his wide shining eyes. Together he and Harry look down at the silver hilt of the knife protruding from the elf's heaving chest. Dobby, no, help. He did not know or care whether they were wizards or muggles, friends or foes. All he cared about was that a dark stain was spreading across Dobby's front and that he had stretched out his thin arms to Harry, look at the language, with a look of supplication, like he is praying to Harry. What did he tell Harry in the Chamber of Secrets? What was Harry for creatures like Dobby, for the downtrodden, the dispossessed, the abused, beacon, a symbol of hope, okay? Harry Potter, and he dies. The elf, next chapter, first page, the elf had gone where he could not call him back. Into the next uh, long paragraph. Harry sat down. He's looking at Dobby. He pulls the blade off. He covers Dobby in a blanket. He hears the ocean. He hears the others. And he sees Voldemort punishing those they had left behind at Malfoy Manor. His rage was dreadful. And yet Harry's grief for Dobby seemed to diminish it so that he doesn't feel the scar. Why? Why was Nagini not able to possess Harry at the Ministry of Magic because of love. 
because of his love for Sirius. Let him kill me, Dumbledore, he says. Let me die. Then the pain will be gone, and I'll see Sirius again. Boom. Voldemort has to let go. Okay? So the others come, and Harry says, no, I want to do it properly. He wants to do what properly? Barry Dobby. Okay? We've seen one. We've seen two, kind of. We've actually only seen one real burial in the entire series. Aragons. Remember? Hagrid and Slughorn get drunk afterwards, but Slughorn does a simple spell and a big old pile of earth <laughs> flips over on top of the giant spider. Okay? Harry, no, I want to do it properly, not by magic. Why is not using magic doing it properly? Dobby is an entirely magical being. Harry is a wizard. I almost said witch. Harry is a wizard. Why would not using magic be the proper way to do it? Yeah. There might be a couple of reasons. One, it's because Harry was raised in kind of a muggle household, so maybe that's just the only proper way that he knows. Okay. And another thing would probably be like, it takes more effort to actually dig up the soil, and it might like... That might symbolize he cared more than if he just... It's a sacrifice. Dead. Yeah. Okay. So he starts to dig, and we get this language. He dug with a kind of fury, relishing the manual work, glorying in the non-magic of it. Almost like Harry's ready to say, F magic, you know. I'm tired of magic. For every drop of his sweat and every blister felt like a gift to the elf who had saved their lives. What's he doing? Harry is offering his suffering for Dobby's behalf. His scar burned, but he was master of the pain. It's the first time we're told that. Harry masters the pain. He controls it. He felt it, yet was apart from it. He had learned control at last, learned to shut his mind to Voldemort. Occlumency. The very thing Dumbledore had wanted him to learn from Snape. Notice, when it comes, it comes when Harry denies magic. Might Rowling be suggesting something there? Because I don't know about you, but I don't have any magical solutions to any of my problems. Wish I did. Not even the lottery. Okay? It's the closest, you know, our world comes to magical solutions, so to speak. So what might be the suggestion? That we've got to learn to control what? What's Harry learned to control here? His response. It's how he responds to all the crap that happens to him. Because nine times out of ten, you know, what do we hear about in newspapers or on the internet in terms of how people respond to things? What do they not tend to do first? How about think? Every instance of road rage is an instance of what? Lack of self-control. I mean, we had it here in MTSU about five years ago. Girl, two different women looking for a parking spot. One girl sitting there, blinker on, waiting for a car to come out. Another car zips right in. This girl gets pissed and stabs the other driver. And is currently serving time. Because I think she got like a 15, 20 year sentence. Okay. Just as Voldemort had not been able to possess Harry while Harry was consumed with grief for Sirius, so his thoughts could not penetrate Harry now. Grief, it seemed, drove Voldemort out. Though Dumbledore, of, care, of course, would have said it was love. And Harry digs deeper and deeper and deeper. What is going on as he digs deeper and deeper and deeper into the ground? What else is he digging deeper and deeper and deeper into? Himself. Because what's he discovering? 
and understanding blossomed in the darkness. The steady rhythm of his arms beat time with his thoughts. Hallows, horcruxes, hallows, horcruxes. And he thought of Wormtail, dead because of one small unconscious impulse of mercy. Dumbledore had foreseen that. How much more had he known? Okay. He wraps Dobby up, puts him in the ground. Dean Thomas gives Dobby a woolen hat. Okay. Ron takes off his shoes and socks, puts them on Dobby's feet. Why? What are they doing? What frees a house elf from enslavement? Clothes. Notice how many clothes Dobby's getting. He's got shoes and socks. He's got a hat. He's got a coat. He is being totally freed. Okay? Luna says some nice words. Harry writes on a rock with his wand. Here lies Dobby, a free elf. Free of what? <laughs> free of pain. Free of sorrow. Free of suffering. Free of the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune of this world. And his mind is now full of those things that had come to him in the grave, ideas that had taken shape in the darkness, ideas both fascinating and terrible. Okay? And he starts to talk to the others. And we're told... Um, still his scar prickled, and he knew that Voldemort... Uh, this is uh, four eighty four eighty, okay, four eighty or four seventy. He looked up. It must be four eighty. He looked out over the ocean. Sorry, um, still a scar prickled. He knew that Voldemort was getting there too. That is, was getting where Harry had seen. Harry understood and yet did not understand. His instinct was telling him one thing, his brain quite another. The Dumbledore in Harry's head smiled, surveying Harry over the tips of his fingers, pressed together as if in prayer. And Harry's thinking, you gave Ron the deluminator. You understood him. You gave him a way back. And you understood Wormtail too. You knew there was a bit of regret there somewhere. If you knew them, what did you know about me, Dumbledore? And Harry finally starts to understand something that happened to him all the way back in the first book. Am I meant to know, but not to seek? Did you know how hard I'd find that? Is that why you made it this difficult? That I'd have, so I'd have time to work it out? Because what happened in the first book? He's made a seeker. We're told by the sorting hat. He has a desire, a thirst to prove himself. That is, to seek what he really is. And he sees the outline of a building that he knew extremely well, Hogwarts. And he sees Voldemort do what? Break into Dumbledore's tomb and take the Elder Wand. Okay? So he talks to Griphook and Ollivander. And Ollivander says, you don't have to kill the previous owner to take possession of a wand. He says, no, I, I don't think that's necessary. Okay. And then that's when we see, towards the very end of the chapter, we see Voldemort go to Dumbledore's tomb. The wrappings fell open. This is the last couple paragraphs. Wrappings fell open, the face was translucent, pale, sunken, yet almost perfectly preserved. How long ago did Dumbledore die? At this point, about a year. They left his spectacles on the crooked nose. He felt amused derision. Had the old fool imagined that marble or death would protect the wand? Had he thought that the Dark Lord would be scared to violate his tomb? Okay. So... Harry admits to Ron and Hermione 
that he knows where the, where the Elder Wand is, and he's letting Voldemort get it, which Ron doesn't understand at all. So why doesn't Harry go after it? Dumbledore didn't want me to have it. He didn't want me to take it. He wanted me to get the Horcruxes. And notice when Harry says that, what he physically does, he falls to the grass on his knees. A sign in literature, always of humility. He could have gotten there first, but he didn't. Dumbledore didn't want him to have it, and now what's he showing? Trust, faith, belief in Dumbledore. Okay? And we're told, in fact, the beginning of the next chapter, second paragraph, the enormity of his decision not to race Voldemort to the wand still scared Harry. He could not remember ever before choosing not to act. I mean, we could go through all six books and what does Harry do? Every single one of them. First book, he goes down through the trap door. Second book, he goes into the Chamber of Secrets. Third book, he goes and rescues Sirius. Fourth book, he goes and he fights Voldemort. Fifth book, he goes to the Ministry of Magic. Sixth book, he tries to fight Snape once the Petrificus Totalis charm is removed on him. Seventh book, he knows where it is. He know Vol knows Voldemort is going to get it, and he doesn't do a thing. He doesn't play the part of the Savior. But we're told a couple of paragraphs later, he's still not easy with this decision. He felt that he was still groping in the dark. He had chosen his path, but kept looking back, wondering whether he had misread the signs, whether he should not have taken the other way. Almost like J.K. Rowling is alluding there to Robert Frost, the road not taken. You know, two words, two roads diverge in a yellow wood. One day when I was out for a walk, and I took the one least traveled, and it ends, and I shall be saying this, Ages and ages hence, with a sigh, two roads, roads diverge in a yellow wood, and I took the one less traveled by. Okay? What is Harry showing here? What does every one of us do when we have a major, major decision to make? And you make that decision. Was it the right one? We always second guess. Right. So they come up with the idea of breaking into Green Gods, which I'm going to skip the entire chapter, because we know something, we know a Horcrux is in the Lestrange's vault. They get the Horcrux, the cup, and go on to the final hiding place. Uh, we'll skip that chapter. The missing mirror. They make their way back to Hogwarts. Excuse me, Hogsmeade. They go to Hogshead. And here he finally meets <coughs> Aberforth Dumbledore, Albus's little brother. And he says, It's your eye I keep seeing in the broken mirror. Okay? And they talk for a while. Um, page 560 or so. Here he says, um, I, I, I've got to get to Hogwarts. And Aberforth says, got to? Why got to? He's dead. In other words, why are you still following my brother's promptings, my, my brother's leadings? Let it go, boy. Before you follow him, save yourself. Harry, I can't. Why not? Now before it says, I was in the Order of the Phoenix. It's finished. You know who's won. It's over. And anyone who's pretending different kidding themselves. Okay? And Harry says, I, I can't stop. I've got a job. Skip over to the next page. Harry kept quiet. This is, he'd been talking about Elphias Doge. 
And Aberforth says, that old Burke thought the sun shone out of my brother's every orifice, he did. Well, so did plenty of people, you three included. Harry kept quiet. He did not want to express the doubts and uncertainties about Dumbledore that had riddled him for months now. He had made his choice while he dug Dobby's grave. He had decided to continue along the winding, dangerous path indicated for him by Albus Dumbledore to accept that he had not been told everything that he wanted to know, but simply to trust. He made the choice to believe, not to know. Okay? So, Aberforth tells them about what happened with the sister, Ariana. And skipping a couple more pages, this is about oh, 568 or so. Aberforth says, why didn't he say to him, take care of yourself? That is, why didn't he say to Harry, take care of yourself? And Harry says, because sometimes you've got to think about more than your own safety. Sometimes you've got to think about the greater good. This is war. You're 17, boy. Harry, I'm of age, and I'm going to keep fighting even if you've given up. Who says I've given up? Hermione. The Order of the Phoenix is finished. You know who's won, blah, 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 blah. I don't say it. I don't say I like it, but it's the truth. Harry, no, it's not. Your brother knew how to finish him off, okay? So he goes on and says, I need to get in the castle. So he goes in the castle. He goes after the lost diadem. And all other kinds of people, Dumbledore's army, etc., start to come through the passage. Chapter 30, the sacking of Severus Snape. We see Harry use the Cruciatus curse on Amicus Cru um, Caro. I'm going to skip. And we see Snape leave the castle and Percy come back to the side of good. Second to the last page. Percy shows up. I was a fool. I was an idiot. I was a pompous prat. I was a, a, and Fred finishes the sentence, ministry-loving, family-disowning, power-hungry moron. Yes, I was. And Fred shakes his hand and says, well, it's good for me. Chapter 31, we get the Battle of Hogwarts. All right. Here he goes off to find the diadem. We find out why the bloody baron is bloody and why he wears chains. It's his penance for having caused the death of Rowena Ravenclaw. Okay. Um, we see Harry defeat Malfoy. Okay, um, and the very end of that chapter, chapter 31, very last two paragraphs, no, 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 someone was shouting, no, Fred, no. And Percy was shaking his brother, and Ron was kneeling beside them, and Fred's eyes stared without seeing the ghost of his last laugh still etched upon his face. So one of the Weasleys, Chapter 32, the world had ended. Why does she do that? Why does she say the world had ended? It literally hadn't. The Weasley family is now, like so many of the other families, broken. So why had the battle not ceased? People are still fighting left and right. Okay. Harry goes off and follows, or excuse me, goes off to um, Harry and Hermione, go off to where Snape is meeting with Voldemort. And I'm like, we don't have time. No, yeah, we might. Yeah, we might. Um, and we see Voldemort and Snape talk. 
Voldemort's talking about the one. Snape is saying, let me go after Potter. I can bring him to you. Snape is merely trying to get away from Voldemort. This is um, page 650 or thereabouts. Voldemort says, I have a problem, Severus. My lord? He raises the Elder One. Why doesn't it work for me, Severus? He says, ah, you, you've done extraordinary magic. He says, no, I've performed my usual magic. A little bit of ego there. I am extraordinary, but this one, no. It has not revealed the wonders it has promised. I feel no difference between this one and the one I procured from Ollivander all those years ago. Okay? So they kind of look at each other. Voldemort moves around. Snape just stands there. And Voldemort says, do you know why I've called you back from the battle? No, my lord, but I beg you, let me return. Let me find Potter. You sound like Lucius. Neither of you understands Potter as I do. He does not need finding. Potter will come to me. I know his weakness, you see. is one great flaw. What is Harry's weakness? According to Voldemort. Aaron? Yeah, love. He will come out of love for all these others. He will hate watching the others struck down around him, knowing that it is for him that it happens. He will want to stop it at any cost. He will come. Snape says, but he might be accidentally killed. So we go, kind of go back and forth. So Voldemort asks, why did both the wands I have used fail when directed to Harry Potter? I cannot answer. Can't you? My wand of you didn't everything of which I asked at Severus except to kill Harry Potter. Twice it failed. Ollivander under torture told me the twin cords, told me to take another's wand. I did so, but Lucius's wand shattered. I have no explanation. I sought a third wand, Severus, the elder wand, the destin, wand of destiny, the destic. I took it from its previous master. I took it from the grave of Albus Dumbledore. What's the mistake he's making? How do you have to take the elder wand? No, you don't have to kill. Ollivander says you don't have to kill. You have to defeat them. Okay? You must win. Okay? The death stick. Uh, my lord, let me go to the boy. All this long night, when I am on the brink of victory, I have sat here, says Voldemort, wondering, wondering why the Elder One refuses to be what it ought to be. Snape doesn't have anything to say. My lord, the Elder One cannot serve me properly, Severus, because I am not its true master. The Elder One belongs to the wizard who killed its last owner. No, it doesn't. <laughs> you killed Albus Dumbledore. While you live, Severus, the Elder One cannot be truly mine. Okay. Was Dumbledore the master of the Elder One when he died? No. Who had already defeated him? Draco. My lord, Snape raises his wand. It cannot be any other way, says Voldemort. I must master the wand, Severus. Master the wand, I master Potter at last. And so he sends Nagini to kill Snape. He's sorry about it, but, you know. And so Harry watches this, and he sees Snape take his thoughts out, put them in a jar, and he tells Harry with his dying words, Look at me. Why? Snape has felt nothing but disgust for Harry all his worthless little life. Why does he want Harry to look at him? Maybe his eyes show that he was sorry for all the things that he put Harry through. It's possible. What else? You're saying it. He has Lily's eyes. He wants the last thing he sees on this earth to be Lily, not Potter's, <laughs> Lily Evans's eyes. Okay? So Voldemort, you know, puts on the PA system and addresses Harry and all the other witches and wizards. He says, we'll take a ceasefire. You can dispose of all your dead. 
who died valiantly. And then he talks to Harry. You have permitted your friends to die for you rather than face me yourself. What's, I mean, master rhetorician. What's he doing there? Fred Weasley's death, Harry, is on your hands. His blood is on you. I shall wait for one hour in the Forbidden Forest. If at the end of that hour you have not come to me, have not given yourself up, then battle recommences. This time I shall enter the fray myself. Harry Potter, and I shall find you, and I shall punish every last man, woman, and child who has tried to conceal you from me. In other words, this time it's personal. They all die. Ron, don't listen to them. Hermione, it'll be all right, Harry. You know, sun will come up tomorrow, kind of a which it does very shortly, okay? And here he is ringing in his mind. You have permitted your friends to die for you, okay? So he takes the memory of Snape, runs up to Dumbledore's office, finds the pensive, and what do we see? Notice, we don't see Snape immediately. We see Harry's aunt and his mother as little girls, nine or ten years old, with Snape. And they're talking about magic. Okay? And even here we're told that Snape looks bat-like. Snape tells Lily she's a witch. On one, uh, sorry, six... About 663, he says, you are. You're a witch. I've been watching you. My mom's one, and I'm a wizard. Petunia laughs. <laughs> wizard. Okay. He tells them about the Ministry of Magic. He tells them about Hogwarts. He tells Lily, you've got loads of magic. Around 568 or so. I saw that all the time. I was watching you. A little creepy. <laughs> Right? And then we see Lily ask him, how are things at home? Fine. They're not arguing anymore? Oh, they're still arguing. But it won't be that long and I'll be gone. Doesn't your dad like magic? He doesn't like much. He doesn't like anything much. Severus, yeah? Tell me about the Dementors again. Because she's worried about getting thrown into Azkaban. Lily gets her letter. She goes off to platform nine and three quarters. Petunia doesn't get a come. And Lily says, I'll, I'll talk to Dumbledore. Petunia acts like she doesn't want to come. And then we find out Lily and Snape read the letter that Dumbledore sent back to Petunia. Okay. Harry sees his father on the train around uh, 671, I think, somewhere around there. Oh, sorry, uh, 668. He saw his father, slight, black-haired, like Snape, but with that indefinable air of having been well cared for, cared for, even adored, that Snape so conspicuously lacked. What does that tell us? How was James raised? We've seen James' double. Harry was essentially raised with him. James was no better than Dudley. He had everything he needed. He had everything he wanted. Notice, with that indefinable air of having been well cared for, cared for, even adored that Snape so conspicuously lacked. Who's Harry's double? Snape. And yet look how Harry turned out. He doesn't turn out mean-spirited like Snape does. Okay. Skip a bunch. And we see Snape come, 673. We see Snape come 
back to Hogwarts with a warning for Dumbledore. And it's to protect Lily Evans. He tells Dumbledore, hide them, hide them all. Keep her, them safe, please. And, and, and what will you give me in return? Anything. And Dumbledore says, she and James put their faith in the wrong person, rather like you, Severus. Weren't you hoping that Lord Voldemort would spare her? Her boy survives. Her son lives. He has her eyes, precisely her eyes. You remember the shape and color of Lily Evans' eyes? I'm sure. Man, that's pretty cruel on Dumbledore's part. Is this re remorse? I, I, I wish I were dead. And what use would that be to anyone? If you loved her, Lily Evans, if you truly loved her, your way forward is clear. You must now help me protect Lily's son. Okay. So Snape says, I'll do it on one condition. Nobody can ever know. And Dumbledore tells us that nobody shall ever know, uh, excuse me, my word severs that I shall never reveal the best of you. Because by ensuring that Harry stays alive, what is Snape doing to himself? He's denying all his desires. He's, he's putting everything he wants out of life on hold. All right? So, Snape and Dumbledore keep talking. The images kind of come and go. We find out what happened when Dumbledore put on the ring. And Snape tells him, you have maybe a year. He puts the ring on in September of book six. You have maybe a year, he says. I cannot tell. There is no halt halting such a spell forever. It will spread. The implication is that when we get to the end of book six, Dumbledore's already a dead man walking. And then he drinks the potion. Okay? So Dumbledore, the next page, says, I have your word that you will protect the students at Hogwarts if I am gone. Okay. They talk about what Draco must do. And Snape asks, are you intending to let him kill you? 678, certainly not. You must kill me. No, no not yet. Snape says, why not let Draco do it? That boy's soul is not yet so damaged. I would not have it ripped apart on my account. And my soul, Dumbledore? Mine? I mean, I think about that. Draco's all of 17, 16 in book six. And my soul, Dumbledore? You alone know whether it will harm your soul to help an old man avoid pain and humiliation. I ask this one great favor of you, Severus, because death is coming for me as surely as the Chudley Cannons will finish bottom of this year's league. I confess I should prefer a quick painless exit to the protected and messy affair it will be if, for instance, Greyback is involved. In other words, consumed by a werewolf. Or dear Bellatrix, who likes to play with her food before she eats it. Okay? So, you must promise to kill me Snape nods his head. So, does Snape rip his soul in two? Is it a murder? It's not necessarily a murder if the person being killed asks for it to be done. I don't know what your thoughts are on euthanasia, but it's, that's closest to what it comes to. Okay. So they start talking again. Next couple pages, 579, 679. Dumbledore's telling Snape about Voldemort's soul. Snape says, I don't understand. Lord Voldemort's soul, maimed it as is, cannot bear close contact with a soul like Harry's, like a tongue on frozen steel, like flesh and flame. Souls, we were talking of minds. 
Almost like Snape, he's not comfortable with soul language. In the case of Harry and Lord Voldemort, to speak of one is to speak of the other. Okay? And then he goes on, after you've killed me, Severus, there's going to be more for you to do. Harry must not know until the last moment, not until it is necessary. Otherwise, how could he have the strength to do what must be done? But what must he do? That's between Harry and me. Okay? So he goes on and he tells Harry, he tells Snape about Nagini and such. And Snape finally understands. So the boy, the boy must die. And Voldemort himself must do it. Severus, that is essential. I, I thought all these years that we were protecting him for her, for Lily. We have protected him because it has been essential to teach him, to raise him, to let him try his strength. Meanwhile, the connection between them grows ever stronger, a parasitic growth. Sometimes I've thought he suspects it himself. If I know him, he will have arranged matters so that when he does set out to meet his death, it will truly mean the end of Voldemort. The him there is Harry. You have kept him alive so that he can die at the right moment. Don't be shocked, Severus. How many men and women have you watched die? Lately, only those whom I could not save. Like Charity Burbage in the Malfoy's house. Severus, please. And he can't raise a finger to save her. <clears throat> you have used me. Meaning, I have spied for you, lied for you, put myself in mortal danger for you. Everything was supposed to be to keep Lily Potter's son safe. Now you tell me you have been raising him like a pig for slaughter. But this is touching, Severus. Have you grown to care for the boy after all? Remember the question Dumbledore asked Harry after they'd been in the memory and Harry saw what Voldemort's mother and grandfather were like and what he saw in the, the orphanage? And he says, Harry, are you feeling pity for Lord Voldemort? No! Snape, for him, expecto patronum. And we see the silver doe. It was Snape who sent the silver doe to lead Harry to the sword of Godric Gryffindor. Because where had the sword of Godric Gryffindor been before it became missing? Hanging in Dumbledore's office. The forest again. Finally, the truth. Lying with his face pressed into the dusty carpet of the office where he had once thought he was learning the secrets of victory, Harry understood at last that he was not supposed to survive. What did he say, what did he think in that chapter in book six when Dumbledore explained to Harry about the prophecy? It was the difference between being dragged into an arena, kicking and screaming, and walking head held high. His job was to walk calmly into death's welcoming arms. Only thing is, in book six, he thought he had a possibility of walking back out of the arena. Now, he doesn't. Along the way, he was to dispose of Voldemort's remaining links to life, so that when at last he flung himself across Voldemort's path and did not raise a wand to defend himself, the end would be clean, and the job that ought to have been done in Godric's Hollow would be finished. Neither would live, neither could survive. What is Harry not thinking of? Not her. Okay, what else? That's not what brings him back, by the way. He's not thinking of what's inside him. The Horcrux. So that when Voldemort attacks Harry, uses a Vada Kedavra on him, and kills Harry, what else is killed? The bit of his soul that's in Harry. He, quote unquote, destroys the Horcrux. So Harry dies and goes off to King's Cross. This cold-blooded walk to his own destruction would require a different kind of bravery. Why had he never, I'm just 
couple lines. Why had he never appreciated what a miracle he was? Brain, nerve, pounding heart. Okay? And he's thinking, that, I must die, it must end. Page uh, 699, 696 or thereabouts. Actually, maybe that page or 695. He was home, Harry's thinking. Hogwarts was the first and best home he had known. He and Voldemort and Snape, the abandoned boys, like Peter Pan's lost boys, had all found home here. He moves on. He goes past Jenny. He goes past the Dementors. And he's thinking, it's not easy to die. Every second he breathed, the smell of the grass, the cool air on his face was so precious. Notice, things he had taken advantage of, things he had taken for granted. And he pulls out the snitch. He sees the words and he thinks, well, this is the close. This is the end. I'm about to die. And he kisses it. And it pops open. And he sees the resurrection stone with the crack down the vertical line representing the Elder Wand. And he suddenly understands. He's not going to bring them back. He's going to join them. And he turns, and there's James, and there's Lily, and there's Remus, and there's Sirius. Does it hurt? Pretty good question to ask when you're walking into death. Serious? Not at all. Quicker and easier than falling asleep. That, by the way, is an allusion to a holy sonnet by John Donne. You can look it up if you want. Death be not proud. And he will want it to be quick. He wants it over, said Lupin. I didn't want you to die, Harry said. These words came without his volition. Any of you, I'm sorry. And he looks at Lupin and says, and right after you'd had your son, Remus, I'm sorry. What were his last words with Lupin prior to the Battle of Hogwarts? He was a coward. Yeah, you're a coward. Okay. I'm sorry too, says Lupin. Sorry I will never know him, but he will know why I died, and I hope he will understand. I was trying to make a world in which he could live a happier life. What is Lupin saying? Notice, he doesn't get to go on living with his child. He is saying, and Rowling is suggesting, just as we saw with the Lord of the Rings, sometimes, in order for people to have a good, happy life, what? Other people have got to die. You know, there's a, there's a meme going around on Facebook. Um, and it's something about, you know, something about um, nonviolent men are unwilling to protect themselves. So violent men stand guard. So they, they have the right not to protect themselves. And it's, you know, a picture of a soldier with his... Weapon. Okay. Notice how the novel ends, by the way. We end with an 11 year old kid going off to Hogwarts who is an orphan whose parents died fighting Voldemort. Only this time, it's not a Potter. This time, it's a Lupin. It's Teddy Lupin. And he's kind of in the same shoes as Harry was. The only difference being, he's not being raised by a horrible aunt and uncle. They keep walking. You'll stay with me till the very end, says James. Harry, they won't be able to see you? We are part of you, says Sirius, invisible to anyone else. He looks at his mother. Stay close to me. Okay. He's never had his mother to be close to him at any significant moment in his life that he's needed. What? 
that hug. And he goes on off. He walks into the forest. We see Hagrid, who's been taken captive. Hagrid yells, No! He saw the mouth move and a flash of green light and everything was gone. King's Cross. He lay face down listening to the silence. He was perfectly alone. Nobody was watching. Nobody else was there. He was not perfectly sure that he was there himself. Long time later, or maybe no time at all, meaning what? He's outside time. He's not in time. Time is meaningless. Came to him that he must exist, must be more than disembodied thought, because he was lying. That is, he was aware of being prone. Definitely lying on some surface. Therefore, he had a sense of touch, and the thing against which he lay existed too. Okay? See, um... Uh, Rene, was it Rene Descartes or was it Blaise Pascal? One of the two said, Cogito ergo sum. I think, therefore I am. Here he's, Descartes. Descartes. Here he's thinking, I feel, therefore I am. And almost as soon as he'd reached this conclusion, he became conscious that he's naked. Convinced as he was of total solitude, it didn't bother him. But it did intrigue him slightly. He's wondering, how became I naked? <laughs> he wondered whether, as he could feel, he would be able to see. Because all this so far is happening with his eyes closed. In opening them, he discovered that he had eyes. Because he can now see. He lay in a bright mist. Though it was not like mist he had ever experienced before. His surroundings were not hidden by cloudy vapor. Rather, the cloudy vapor had not formed yet into surroundings. Why not? Okay. He's just opened his eyes. What does he see? It's like being in the middle of a cloud. Why? He doesn't know where he is. He doesn't know what anything is. So if you don't know what anything is, for example, this, then how do you really see it? That is, if it makes no sense whatsoever to you. You see its shape, maybe, but you don't understand it at all. You can't identify it. So, the floor in which he lay seemed to be white, neither warm nor cold, but simply there. A flat, blank, something. He's not even sure that it's a floor. He sits up. His body appeared unscathed. He touches his face. He's not wearing glasses anymore. And yet, how does he see? Perfectly. He sees clearly, and he's not wearing his glasses. Then he hears a noise through the unformed nothingness that surrounded him. The small, soft thump thumpings of something that flapped, flailed, and struggled. It was a pitiful noise, yet also slightly indecent. He had the uncomfortable feeling that he was eavesdropping on something furtive, shameful. And for the first time, he wished he were clothed. Why? Something else is here. I'm naked. And he suddenly dressed. Excuse me, he suddenly sees robes. He takes them, puts them on. They're soft, clean, and warm. Notice they're not the robes he wore into the forest. Why? Because Avada Kedavra, he falls into the forest, then they get what on them? Dirt, pine needles, leaves. It was extraordinary how they'd appeared just the moment he wanted them. He stood up, looking around. Was he in some great... Room of requirement. Longer he looked, the more was to see. Great domed glass roof appears. Perhaps it was a palace. And he still hears that noise, and he turns and looks. 
and his surroundings seem to invent themselves before his eyes. That word, invent, it doesn't mean to create, though we tend to think it does. And the word invention does not literally mean to make something new. It means to discover, to uncover. So it's like all this stuff around him is suddenly uncovered or it's revealed to him. It's kind of like the Great Hall, except, and he recoils. He jumps back. He had spotted the thing that was making the noises. It had the form of a small naked child curled on the ground, its skin raw and rough, flayed looking. What's flayed? Nope, close. It's when you have your skin pulled off. Okay. A lot of the accounts of tortures of the early Christians is having them flayed alive. And, you, you know, you can actually read the accounts of serial murderers doing the same kind of thing. Okay. Flayed looking, and it looked, and it lay shuddering under a seat where it had been left, unwanted, stuffed out of sight, struggling for breath. Who left it unwanted, struggling for breath? Voldemort? Marope? Is this Voldemort's beginning? Or is this merely the bit of Voldemort that is still alive? He was afraid of it. Small and fragile and wounded though it was, he did not want to approach it. Nevertheless, he drew slowly nearer. Notice, Harry is drawn to this thing. Soon he stood near enough to touch it, yet he could not bring himself to do it. He felt like a coward. He ought to comfort it, but it repulsed him. He feels like, I ought to bring this thing some kind of comfort. You cannot help, and there's Albus Dumbledore. Harry spreads his arms wide. You wonderful boy, you brave, brave man. Let's walk. And so he goes and walks. As they go away from the flayed child that lay whimpering. And Harry says, but you're dead. Yes. Then I'm dead too. Well, that's the question, isn't it? On the whole, dear boy, I think not. Not? Not. Harry, but. He raises his hand and he feels for the scar and it's not there. But I should have died. I didn't defend myself. I meant to let him kill me. And that will, I think, have made all the difference. Same language, by the way, that is used in Robert Frost's The Road Not Taken. Okay. Why will that have made all the difference? And why does that mean, according to Dumbledore, Harry is not dead. And is Dumbledore even right? Is Harry not dead? Dumbledore's really dead. Harry's going to ask him, so is all this merely happening in my head? And therefore it's not real? And Dumbledore's going to say, well, just because it's happening in your head doesn't mean it's not real, right? Because you have ideas in your head. Are the ideas not real? So, I let him kill me, didn't I? You did. Go on. Ah, now Harry understands. So the part of his soul that was in me, come on, come on, has it gone? Oh yes, he destroyed it. Your soul is whole and completely your own. And Harry looks over at the thing sitting under the chair. What is that, Professor? Something that is beyond either of our help. But Harry doesn't think so. Because when he goes back, he's going to offer Voldemort something. But if Voldemort used the killing curse, how can I be alive? I think you know. Come on, Harry. Think back. Think back. He took my blood. Bingo. 
He took your blood and rebuilt his living body with it. Your blood in his veins, Harry. Lily's protection inside both of you. In other words, if Harry is not fully 100 complete, perfectly dead, it's because there's a little teeny tiny bit of him coursing through Voldemort's living body. Okay? So Harry is, in a sense, tethered to the real world. Voldemort's body is what, in a sense, for this part of Harry? A horcrux. Only difference is it's not Harry's soul that's in Voldemort. Okay? So, Dumbledore says, you were the seventh horcrux, Harry, the horcrux he never meant to make. He rendered his soul so unstable it broke apart when he committed those acts of unspeakable evil, the murder of your parents. Okay, and he goes on and talks about his knowledge remained woefully incomplete, Harry. That which Voldemort does not value, he takes no trouble to comprehend. Of house elves and children's tales, of love, loyalty, and innocence, Voldemort knows and understands nothing. Nothing. They all have a power beyond his own, a power beyond the reach of any magic. It's a truth he has never grasped. Children's tales have a power beyond the magic of Voldemort. <clears throat> he took your blood, believing it would strengthen him. He took into his own body a tiny part of the enchantment your mother laid upon you when she died for you. His body keeps her sacrifice alive, and while that enchantment survives, so do you, and so does Voldemort's one last hope for himself. And Harry, and you knew this all along. Yeah, I guessed. Okay. So they keep talking. And Harry says, He killed me with your wand. No, he failed to kill you with my wand. I think we can agree that you are not dead. Though, of course, I do not minimize your sufferings, which I'm sure were severe. Yet, Harry, we're going to be told shortly, could choose to do what at this point? Yes, two choices. He can go back. In which case he can defeat Voldemort, or attempt to. Or he can, to use nearly headless next phrase, go on. Harry wants to know where they are. And he says, it looks like King's Cross, Dumbledore. Does it really? Hmm. Harry, where do you think we are? My dear boy, I have no idea. This is, as they say, your party. That is, we're having this conversation in your mind. So Harry asks about the Deathly Hallows. And what do we discover about Dumbledore? He wanted power. He wanted power greatly. And he says, uh, 715, thereabout, I had learned that I was not to be trusted with power. I had proven as a very young man that power was my weakness and my temptation. It is a curious thing, Harry, but perhaps those who are best suited to power are those who have never sought it. Who's going to be made Minister of Magic? Kingsley Shackable. Did he ever want it? Nope. Those who, like you, have leadership thrust upon them, a little nod to Shakespeare, and take up the mantle because they must, and find to their own surprise that they wear it well. So don't vote for anybody who's running for president, because none of them are, according to this kind of logic, ready. Dumbledore, I was safer at Hogwarts. Okay. He goes on and he talks about on page 20, 720, excuse me. So that's not page 715, must be 719 or so. Um, he says, I was such a fool, Harry. All those years, after all those years, I'd learned nothing. I was unworthy to unite the Deathly Hallows. Okay. That's why he had the invisibility cloak the night that James was killed. 
And he tells her, 7.27.21, You are the true master of death because the true master does not seek to run away from death. He accepts that he must die and understands that there are far, far worse things in the living world than dying. Like? You could be a Yazidi woman or a Christian woman living under the rule of ISIS. <laughs> or not even a woman, you could be an eight-year-old girl living under the rule of ISIS. Okay? There are a lot of things worse. Dumbledore goes on. Or, excuse me. Harry says, if you planned your death, this is the, about the last page. If you planned your death with Snape, you meant him to end up with the Elder One, didn't you? Dumbledore says, yep. Didn't work quite as I intended it. And then Harry asks, I've got to go back, haven't I? It's up to you. I've got a choice? Of course you do. I think if you decided not to go back, you would be able to, let's say, um, board a train. He thinks he's at King's Cross. Where would it take me? On. Notice Dumbledore doesn't explain. Voldemort's got the Elder One. Yes, he does. But you want me to go back. I think if you choose to return, there is a chance you may be finished for good. I cannot promise it. I know this, Harry. You have less to fear from returning here than he does. What's Dumbledore mean? Harry will return here, wherever the here is. Why does Harry have less reason to fear? Oh, he hasn't done the horrible things Voldemort has done. Do not pity the dead, Harry. As Harry is looking at the raw thing under the tape, under the chair. Do not pity the dead, Harry. Pity the living. And above all, pity those who live without love. Who is the greatest example of those who live without love? Voldemort. What's Dumbledore saying? Pity him. Show him mercy. By returning, you may ensure that fewer souls are maimed, fewer families are torn apart. If that seems to you a worthy goal, then we say goodbye for the present. Why only for the present? Because we'll see each other again. Harry goes back. Okay. He notices it looked like Voldemort had also collapsed, that he'd been briefly unconscious. Voldemort sends Narcissa to see if Harry's dead. Is Draco alive? Is he in the castle? Yes. And she lies to Voldemort. But I thought nobody lied to Voldemort. He always knows, as he says. So why doesn't he know at this point? Okay. Why else? I mean, I think it's possible. What's he been looking forward to for 16 years? Maybe he's a little giddy with his final victory. Maybe he hasn't mastered his own emotions. So they go off to the castle. Okay. Harry escapes. We see Neville step up to the plate. Page 738. Great Hall, final battle. Molly Weasley kills Bellatrix. And Harry yells to everybody, I don't want anyone else to try to help. It's got to be like this. It's got to be me. And he tells... Tom Riddle, there are no more Horcruxes, it's just you and me. Neither can live while the other survives. Okay? And Harry says to Voldemort, you won't be killing anyone else tonight. They circle each other like, you know, cats getting ready to get into a fight. 
You won't be able to kill any of them ever again. Don't you get it? I was ready to stop you. I was ready to die to stop you hurting these people. But you didn't. That is, you didn't die. Therefore, you can't cast that charm, Harry. But I meant to. That is, intention counts. I've done what my mother did. Only he's done it for whom? Not just for one person. He really is the chosen one. He died, what? For everyone. <clears throat> Haven't you noticed how none of the spells you put on them are binding? You can't torture them. You can't touch them. You don't learn from your mistakes, Riddle, do you? You dare. Yes, I dare. I know things you don't know, Tom Riddle. I know lots of important things that you don't. Want to hear some before you make another big mistake? Voldemort, no. He's going to talk about love. Love, again. Dumbledore's favorite solution, love, which he claimed conquered death. The love did not stop him falling from the tower and breaking like an old waxwork. Love, which did not prevent me stamping out your mudblood mother like a cockroach potter. Nobody seems to love you enough to run forwards this time and take my curse. So what will stop you dying now when I strike? Just one thing. It is not, if it is not love that will save you this time, you must believe you have magic that I do not, or else a weapon more powerful than mine. Both. You think you know more magic than I do. Okay. Harry says, Dumbledore knew more than you, knew enough not, not to do what you've done. You mean he was weak. First book. There is only power in those too weak to seek it. You mean he was weak, too weak to dare, too weak to take what might have been his, what will be mine. No, he was cleverer than you. I brought about the death of Albus Dumbledore. You thought you did, but you were wrong. Harry says, yes, Dumbledore is dead, but not at your hands. He chose his own manner of dying, chose it months before he died, arranged the whole thing. He says, Snape was Dumbledore's. You could say Snape was Dumbledore's man through and through, like Harry had said. Dumbledore's from the moment you started hunting down my mother, and you never realized it, because of the thing you can't understand. In other words, I don't think it's only that Snape was an Occlumens that enabled him to protect himself against, Dumbled against Voldemort. It's partially it. But it's also because of his love for Lily Evans. Voldemort couldn't see that. And he couldn't see through that. Snape Patronus was a doe, says Harry, the same as my mother's, because he loved her for nearly all of his life, from the time when they were children. You should have realized. He asked you to spare her life, didn't he? Well, he desired her. In other words, it was lust. Of course he told you that. But he was Dumbledore's spy from the moment you threatened her. Dumbledore was already dying and Snape finished him. Voldemort says, it doesn't matter. He's dead. And then he says, he killed Dumbledore. I killed him. So the Elder Wand, the Death Stick, the Wand of Destiny is truly mine. Dumbledore's last plan went, long, went wrong. Harry, you're right, it did. But before you try to kill me, I'd advise you to think about what you've done. Think and try for some remorse, Riddle. Try to think about what you've done. In other words, kind of sit down for a moment and take an inventory of your life. Start with pros and cons. <laughs> Not many over here. Cons. Who have I killed? <laughs> uh, you know, who did I steal from? Who did I cheat? Who did I... What is this? Of all the things that Harry said to him beyond any revelation or taunt, nothing had shocked Voldemort like this. It's your one last chance. It's all you've got left. I've seen what you'll be otherwise. The red flayed baby-like thing. Be a man. What has he said before about being a man? I'm more than a human. He wants to be as I've mentioned it before, Nietzsche's Ubermensch, the 
over or super man. The one not bound by common laws and standards of morality and such. Be a man. Try, try for some remorse. Notice what Rowling is suggesting there. A real man does feel remorse for his actions. Or woman, you dare? Yes, I dare, because Dumbledore's last plan hasn't backfired on me at all. It's backfired on you, Riddle. And he says, well, it still isn't working right, is it? <coughs> Severus Snape was never the true master of the Elder One, but he killed Dumbledore. Snape never beat Dumbledore. Dumbledore's death was planned. You don't get it, do you? Possessing the wand isn't enough. Holding it, using it, doesn't make it yours. The wand chooses the wizard. The true master of the Elder Wand was Draco Malfoy. Now I remember, I think Draco's here. Draco's got to be sitting there going, What? What does it matter? Even if you are right, Potter, it makes no difference to you and me. You no longer have the Phoenix Wand. We do on skill alone, and after I've killed you, I can attend to Draco. But you're too late. You missed your chance. I got there first. I overpowered Draco weeks ago. I took this wand from him. And he shows Voldemort Draco's Hawthorne wand. So it all comes down to this. Now notice what this means. Does the wand in your hand know its last master was disarmed? So if the wand in Voldemort's hand knows somehow, like it has a conscience or consciousness, knows that its last master was Draco because Draco defeated Dumbledore and Harry defeated Draco, then the wand should answer to Harry. Does the wand in your hand know its last master was disarmed? Because if it does, I am the true master of the Elder Wand. And notice what happens right at that moment. A red gold glow burst suddenly across the enchanted sky above them. They're in the Great Hall. The ceiling of the Great Hall does what? Always. It reflects what's going on outside. It reflects, it magically portrays what is going on in the sky outside. What's going on? The sun has just risen. Red, gold. Colors of what? Gryffindor. <laughs> it's not black and green. A red glow, gold, gold glow burst suddenly across the enchanted sky above them as an edge of dazzling sun appeared over the sill of the nearest window. The light hit both their faces at the same time so that Voldemort was suddenly a flaming blur. Harry heard the high voice shriek as he too yelled his best hope to the heavens. Expel your armies. Avada Kedavra. Tom Riddle hit the floor with a mundane finality. What does mundane mean? Common, ordinary, every day. He hit the floor like a sack of potatoes. Feeble, shrunken, the white hands empty, the snake-like face vacant and unknowing. Voldemort was dead, killed by his own rebounding curse. And here he stood with two wands in his hand. Because the elder one flipped into his hand. The, stun, can't talk. the sun rose steadily over Hogwarts and the great hall blazed with life and light. Harry was an indispensable part of the mingled outpourings of jubilation and mourning, grief and celebration. They wanted him there with him, their leader and symbol, their savior and their guide. And that he had not slept, that he craved the company of only a few of them, seemed to occur to no one. In other words, Harry is kind of, you know, if you've seen the Hunger Games, the, the um, first part of Mockingjay, like the scene when Katniss goes into the hospital. And the people are asking her, are you going to fight first? Are you going to be one of us? And they're reaching out for her. Why? Like she can heal them. And they just want to touch her. Okay? That's what's going on here. 
What's Harry want to do? Put yourself in Harry's shoes. He probably wants to go off somewhere and cry. Fred's dead. Lupin's dead. Tonks is dead. Hedwig's dead. Mad Eye's dead. The Creevy Brothers are dead. We, can, you know, which I don't really care about because they're painful characters, anyways. You know, but there's a lot of people that Harry does like that are now dead. He must speak to the bereaved, clasp their hands, witness their tears, receive their thanks, hear the news now creeping in from every quarter as the morning drew on, that the imperious up and down the country had come back to themselves. Why? Because they were imperious kind of under Voldemort's authority. And like, you know, in the one Star Wars film, you blow up the Death Star, and what happens to all those drones? And all those clones, they fall down. Or like when... Sauron is destroyed. What happens to his army? No will to fight. Death Eaters were fleeing or else being captured. The innocent of Azkaban were being released. And that Kingsley Shackle had been named Temporary Minister for Magic. Okay. Harry goes off to Dumbledore's office and starts to talk to Dumbledore's portrait. And what does he do with the Elder Wand? And the resurrection stone. Elder one he puts back in Dumbledore's tomb. The stone, he dropped it in the forest. He doesn't know where. Should the book end there? Is it necessary to have the 19 years later? The epilogue. Or what does it add to it? I just saw something the other day. Somebody uh, tweeted, I think, tweeted a, a question to J.K. Rowling. And she answered. This is a question she'd never, she hadn't answered in, this book came out in 2007, so eight years. And the question was, because um, there's been a lot of talk, why did Harry name his kid Albus Severus? Why name, give the middle name, after Snape? When Snape was such a rotten, mean SOB to Harry all of his life. And she said, you know, well, it was for forgiveness and this kind of stuff. Because, you know, Snape loved Harry's mother and Snape did protect Harry. And man, people are coming out of the woodwork really angry at her. Because of that. Because they think... Snape was a dirty, rotten SOB. He should have died. A horrible, rotten death. How he died wasn't bad enough. Okay? I had a student uh, in 2013 in London. Man, she, she just could not stand Snape. Um, I mean, she would get into arguments with pretty much everybody in the class. And this was a large class, right? I think we had 24 students. Um, and nobody agreed with her. I mean, she was like, Snape ought to be crucified because he was so rotten and because he was twisted. Her argument for him being twisted was his love for Lily. I, maybe some of you think this. Her argument was, that's not love. That was some weird, obsessive, compulsive, stalker stuff. Okay? Um, I don't know what you think about that. All right. That's all for that. Um, like I uh, said earlier, in case you came in late, I've emailed the exam to both your pipeline at mtmail at mtsu.edu and to the DTL, uh, D2L, the eLearn um, email address. The exam is due a week from today at by noon, either in the box on my door or in my mail slot in the um, English department office. I'll be in my office probably around 11.30 or so, and I will leave at noon. If it's there at noon 05, I will not get it. I am flying out of town on Friday. I will not be back on campus at all after I get all my exams from all my classes that day. All right.